All right. Thank, thank you, Chris, for coming on the show today. Hey, Savan. Thanks. That's really a treat for me. The uh, we're we're just uh, getting off to the uh, start to the to the year, and um, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, uh, male friendships. Right. And um, uh, this is a, an area I think I mentioned uh, to you uh, that uh, is uh, kind of confusing for a lot of people, including myself, um, especially uh, me, uh, men connecting uh, with, uh, other men, uh, in the life of the church. Right. And, and I, um, for, for years, I've been, uh, interested, uh, and passionate about small group ministry and, and just the question of how do we connect and support, uh, uh, our friends in church, members right. of the church. Um, and, uh, for, for a lot of guys, it, it's hard to, to, to feel plugged in, to feel right uh, you know, a part of the life of the church. So, uh, uh, excited to talk to you about that, uh, today. No, I'm excited to share. I mean, um, you know, as we were talking about before the, we before we started the show, um, you know, if you had seen me 10 years ago or talked to me 10 years ago, you never would have believed that I'd be sitting here talking about this topic because I, was somebody who really had very few close male friends um, and none in the church that I attended. I mean, I, I was friendly with guys, but it was all surface level. It was the, Hey, how about those Browns or how, how much those Browns suck typically, you know, because the Browns are usually terrible <laughs> um, and, or, you know, just, just small talk, but I really did not connect with men at any deep level. I had maybe two close male friends and neither one went to my church, mm. but I've been doing reading on this topic. And it turns out that I was not alone. I mean, most men, I think it's the majority of men in church have very few close friends at church, close male friends. Uh, and a lot, a lot of them have few close male friends, period. Right. And this is especially true among younger men. Now we're finding that um, mm. I saw a recent survey and I think it was 25% of young men had no close male friends. So, um, yeah, it's definitely an area that the church and men in the church should be aware of and trying to do something about, because we've got a lot of guys that are just kind of drifting through life without a band of brothers, without mm -hmm. men around them that, you know, when the wheels fall off at three in the morning, who are you going to call? You know, if right. you don't, if you don't have anybody to call, you know, then it makes life tough. Mm. So, yes. yeah. Yeah. So the, um, that, that's, that's so key. And, and, um, it, you, you're going to share, uh, like how, how that changed for you right. uh, but before you d uh, dive into that. Can you share with listeners a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, well, I've been a Christian a long time. Um, but I consider myself just kind of a pew sitter. I don't, I don't have any kind of a degree in, um, theology. Um, uh, my kids are actually more, they have more credentials <laughs> when it comes to Christianity than I do. They went to Christian high schools. They went to Christian colleges. Uh, my son is a worship leader. Um, but I've just mm -hmm. been, you know, kind of your average Joe, um, you know, I value my relationship with the Lord. Um, faithfully attended church, got involved in various things at church, but, um, you know, in a lot of ways was kind of on the sidelines, even though I was at church, I, I really wasn't active in the life of the church. And like I said, I really wasn't, wasn't interacting with other men. Um, you mentioned small group ministry and what I found, uh, my wife and I would go to a couple small groups. Um, and what I found there was that the women kind of drove most of what happened there, especially mm -hmm. at prayer time. You know, you ask a guy to pray in a couple of small group and you're lucky if you get, you know, a couple of sentences out of them. And, and so I, I just, you know, I've had this as a part of my life for a long time where um, I just was kind of missing. I was missing something in my Christian walk um, professionally. Um, I was, uh, in the high tech world for 27 years, um, mostly as a product manager. 
And uh, then in my 40s, uh, I and four other 40 something year old guys left our cushy jobs at Cisco Systems and started a Wi Fi company in Akron, Ohio, <laughs> which sounds about as crazy. I mean, I know it sounds crazy. Um, but by the grace of God, six years to the day after we started it, we got bought. And, uh, hmm. and I was one of four owners that remained at the time. One of the guys uh, ended up leaving. And so I retired um, from the high tech world in 2013. Um, and uh, really did not like retirement. I, I kind of failed retirement because, um, mm -hmm. you know, so much of my life had been oriented around my job and my profession. You know, I worked long hours. I, I took my job very seriously. I wasn't a workaholic, but I, I definitely put in, I, I put every energy into my job. And then when I walked away, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about that time, I think maybe a year earlier than that, that um, there was a presentation at our church. And I, at the time, our small church had closed in 2009. So we were starting to go to a local mega church and they called guys in and they said, you really need to do this men's ministry called uh, CLC. Um, but you know, it was kind of the, the pitch was kind of the few, the proud, the Marines, you know, it was a two-year program. You're going to meet with a small group of guys, about 12 guys every week um, for two hours. You're going to be spending four or five, six hours of your own time, maybe more every week, getting into the Bible, getting into extra reading. Wow. And, and I sat there and I said, that's a big ask. You know, I, I, first of all, I don't do anything with men, you know, other than play sports mm. and, and work with men. Um, but something was gnawing at me that I, I needed to do this. You know, I was in my forties and I just felt like, you know, kind of like I felt when I did the startup, it's like, you know, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. I, I've got, I've got to take the plunge. I got to try this, even though it was, it was way outside my comfort zone. Mm. And so I ended up doing the two-year program and uh, did an additional year and a half after we finished that two-year program. And um, it, it, it changed my life. It, it changed so many things about my life. Um, and as a result today, my new career is that I'm writing men's devotionals and I am working with the men's ministry, CLC, that got me on this track. And I'm, I'm meeting with guys and it's just, it's, I'm a new man. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's just, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm very different than I was 10 years ago. And it's all God. It's, it's because I, I took the chance. I followed what the Holy spirit was asking me to do. And it's just, it's, it's changed my life. That, that's amazing. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very encouraging and hopeful to, to me to hear that you could have such a big change uh, in, in your life and the way you relate to other people, like in your forties. Um, right. And uh, j just because uh, you, you, you had like, sounds like you, you just kind of had uh, like a disconnect or, or distance um, with guys, not animosity, uh, but just didn't click with them in, in your, your twenties and thirties. Um, all right. I, I'm curious, Chris, uh, you're, uh, before, uh, this program, mm -hmm. uh, what did you look like a a as a husband and a father? What would your, your family observe? I would say that, um, I mean, I, I set as a priority that God should be the center of the marriage. God should be the center of the, of the family. Um, I think I did an okay job of that, but I would say that there were two things that really impeded my effectiveness as, uh, as a husband and a father. One, one was, um, I was, I was, I was very driven, um, to succeed. Um, and I, I always 
fancied myself to just be a hard worker. Hmm. But I think there was something behind it. And as with most sins, um, what was behind it for me was pride. Hmm. Um, I still struggle with it today. I can't say, oh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I've overcome my pride. Um, but I, C.S. Lewis wrote that, that pride is the worst of all sins. And um, it was definitely true for me. I, I just, it prevented me from being vulnerable, prevented me from, um, you know, it was very hard for me to admit mistakes. I think it, you know, it drove a wedge between me and my wife. Um, I think it kept me distant from my kids um, because I was always out to, to climb that next mountain to, you know, to, to prove that I could do things versus um, being the relational husband and father and friend that I really should have been. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I still struggle with it today, but I think that I've made progress since, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I think my kids would say the same. I think my oldest has remarked that my relationship with with God is much more evident now than it was back then. I mean, I was not just a nominal Christian, but you, you really couldn't, you couldn't really tell that I had a, a faith in Christ. Um, and now she comments that it's, it's, it's more evident. And she wouldn't say that, <laughs> you know, it's extremely evident all the time, but, but um, yeah, I, I think that, I, I think that my pride and, and fear, I, I think a lot of I think the flip side of, of pride or what drives pride a lot of times is fear. And I had a big fear of failure. Um, I had a big fear of um, being found out that I was kind of a screw up. Um, my, my first marriage was 26 years and a lot of it was just really hard. It was hard for my wife. It was hard for me. We just, we just struggled, but you know, when you go to church, you don't typically lead with that stuff, you know? Um, and I always felt like other Christian men had their act together and, you know, yeah. I didn't. So I just wasn't, I wasn't going to admit that, you know, in my life is basically a mess. Um, yeah. So that, that, that kept me kind of at arm's length with men and with, with women too, but especially with men in the church, because I just felt like I'm going to be exposed as a fraud. Mm, man. The, there's lots of, of couples, lots of families, lots of marriages that are struggling that do not, um, share that, that struggle, that, that burden. Right. Um, and, um, and so many, so many couples, uh, struggling alone with it, it make, doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah. the stress of it. Um, and so, yeah, learning how to, um, to support, uh, each other or, or, or be more open with and, and honest with, with, with life, um, is, can, can be so helpful. Is that what you experienced at the CLC? You were able to share a little bit more about Yeah, that helped. Really that helped. I mean, I had, I, I had caught glimpses of it before. One thing that I have, you know, that is plainly obvious to me now, but I, I occasionally caught glimpses of in the past was that when you are vulnerable with somebody else, they respond with vulnerability back to you. I mean, I, I guess I always feared that if I, if I said, Oh, you know, my marriage is a mess or I'm really struggling with this, or, you know, I'm, um, I, I messed up with my kids I always thought that Christians would respond negatively to that. Like, uh, I don't know why, but the opposite is true, mm. especially with men. You know, mm. when, when one man kind of is vulnerable and exposes himself to other men and, and says, you know, they typically rally around him or they say, oh gosh, you know, I, I did the same thing. Um, but I just had this fear of, of doing that. Um, and you know, you talked about marriages, um, boy, we as Christians just are so afraid to be vulnerable and, and I understand the fear, but I read a report 
fairly recently that talked about um, they looked at couples in in churches. These are active. These are you know these these are couples that are going to church you know three four times a week, and they studied you know are they involved in a small group? Are they involved in ministries in the church? Do they have a leadership position in the church. Um, you know how active are are, are they in worshiping? Um, small group attendance, all these different metrics. And, um, and they looked at couples who ended up separating um, three months, you know, within three months of when the metrics were taken versus couples that had strong and healthy marriages. And there was absolutely no difference. I mean, it was amazing, oh. you know, down, down to almost a percentage point, you know, 30, you know, 43% of the couples who ended up getting a divorce were active in a small group and 42% of the couples with healthy marriages. And so mm. church pastors, activity. pastors can't tell pastors can't tell. Nobody can tell you, you go to church. And, and my, mm. my first wife and I did exactly that. I mean, mm. we went to church every Sunday. We had the kids with us. We put on the smiles and you in the, the meantime, in Christian you know, school. the marriage, the, yeah, the kids are in Christian You're school doing, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, and then one day the marriage is over, you know, it's just, mm. so yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, but people have to start becoming vulnerable, you know, and you don't want to, you don't want to broadcast it, you know, on the PA system at church, but you've got to find people in church or people, you know, trusted Christians, you got to have some in your life that you can sit, you know, over coffee or sit down. Obviously going to a counselor, a counselor is great. And, and I, I, I've been to counseling many, many times and benefited greatly from it. But in addition to that, you've got to have a friend, you've got to have a friend or two that you can just open up to mm -hmm. in confidence and not, not be judged, but, but have them, have them pray for you, have them support you and have them give you some biblical counsel and direction. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, the CLC program is yeah two two years you're 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 meeting weekly for two hours yeah um so there's a, a relational component to it but then right. you're also learning or studying outside of of the meeting so right uh what what was that like for you chris like this is like a whole new world for you what, what were some of the things that you learned early on that were helpful that that kept you going what was pro probably most beneficial for me was the relational aspect of it. I, I, I love studying stuff. I mean, I was a product manager, so I did market research before Google existed. And then I got really good at doing internet searches when, you know, search engines came around, but I thrive on that stuff. I, I, I like reading, you know, in-depth studies of things. Um, so the, you know, you're going to spend six hours a week outside of class studying scripture and reading books and stuff that didn't, I didn't mind that at all. Um, it was difficult sometimes to find the time, but that kind of hits me where I live. But the relational aspect of, of CLC really kind of overtook me within, I'd say, six months. And, you know, initially, and, and, and the nice thing about CLC is that there's typically not a leader. So the guys in the group will take turns leading that particular week's discussion. And so early on, you know, when it was my turn to lead, then okay, let's let's get into the study, and you know, I, I would be very task oriented, and let's let's do let's do what we're supposed to do, and then we'll pray at the end, kind of thing. But within a couple of months, I realized, and everybody in the group realized that it was the prayer time that kept us coming back, mm -hmm. because guys would start to open up. You know, it take it take it took guys a couple of months before they would really open up some guys it took longer, mm -hmm. but once they did, you know, it was just, it, it was earth shattering because, um, we, we ended up moving the prayer time from the end of the beginning. And of that two hours, sometimes the whole first hour would just be guys sharing. Here, here's what's going on in my life. I'm, I'm really, I'm having a tough time or I, I have a cause for celebration, whatever it was. There'd be times we'd stop the whole meeting. We'd go gather around a guy and just pray for him, you know? And um, so the study became secondary. It was, it was still important, you know, and obviously everything there is biblically based, 
but it was the relationships. Um, and, and one of the things they encourage you to do is outside of your usual meeting time, go have coffee with each guy in the group. I never did that. I never met guys. I didn't know very well for coffee. I didn't meet anybody for coffee, you know? <laughs> um, but that was, that was great too, because, you know, when I overcame my, my fear of doing that and just, you know, sat down with a virtual stranger to have coffee and get to know them, it was great, you know? So <laughs> now I do it all the time. You know, I'm, I'm out for breakfast and coffee with guys all the time, you know, guys I know fairly well and guys I've just, I've just met. Yes. So yeah, it was, it was the relation. It was, it, it was becoming a band of brothers with, with the, you know, Christ is the center. That was just, just something I'd never seen before. You know, I had been involved in, in Bible studies and Sunday school and small groups, but I, I just hadn't seen it before. Mm. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the study, uh, the even and you mentioned like there was prayer time in in the couples group but but really the 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 prayer meant so much because of the the honesty and and opening right. up um and uh it, it and it's one of the, the commitment that you guys were committed to stick sticking sticking it out like <laughs> like you you were in yeah. it for two years <laughs> right and the other, the other key that they told us up front was that everything that's said in this room stays in this room mm -hmm. because nothing will kill uh, a men's ministry or any ministry faster than a breach in confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if somebody's suicidal, or, or then, then you've got to bring somebody's attention to it. But, you know, you're not going to be vulnerable with somebody if you know, your wife hears about it from his wife the next Sunday. I mean, that, that's it. You get one, ch one chance and you're done. So yeah, one of the cardinal roles of CLC is that anything shared in this room stays in this room. And um, once you all trust that that's going to happen, then you can really open up. And so that was a, that was a foundational piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the uh, forming a brotherhood, uh, for forming those bonds, meeting with, with guys, uh, outside of the, the, the meeting for, for coffee, you, um, this all after having just a couple friends, now you have a whole bunch of friends. Um, right. Right. And, and, and you're, and you're continuing to do that right now. What would you say, Chris, were, uh, was was where you you had to 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 be brave um uh in, in the process um um well i think that i think that the that going through the divorce really challenged me to rely on god and to, I, I don't consider myself a really brave person, but, um, I, I was able to be vulnerable with my kids who really struggled with, you know, the end of a 26 year marriage of their parents. I mean, you know, they were all 18 or older at the time, but there's never, I mean, divorce is terrible. You know, there's never, there's never a good time to get divorced. And it's not like if your kids are older, they'll be fine with it. Um, but I think that I was able to, I was more able to just be real with people and say, yeah, you know, I, I, I made mistakes. Um, I, my first marriage ended, um, and so I wrote the devotional, uh, daily strength for men in 2017. And in the middle of it is when my, my wife said that we were, we were done. She wanted to separate and we ultimately ended up getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. And so I finished the book, but I, I didn't, I didn't lead with that when I, <laughs> when I went to the publisher, I didn't say, oh, by the way, I just got divorced. You know, I didn't, I didn't think it would help the credibility of the book. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
when the book came out in 2018, I started going to various men's conferences to say, Hey, I've got a men's devotional coming out. And I just felt very awkward because, you know, I, I was a, I was a divorced man who was promoting a men's devotional. It just, it, it just seemed not, not like a great thing. Um, but because I was becoming more vulnerable and more open with men, when I started sharing this, even at a men's conference, like I said earlier, you know, men were very supportive. I mean, you know, nobody likes divorce and, and, you know, they didn't say all oh, that. That's great. But, you know, they, they understood and they, and, and a lot of them would admit, yeah, my first marriage ended or, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm still married, but we've had a lot of struggles and it, it, they were not condemning. They were the opposite. They were, they were supportive. They were encouraging. Mm -hmm. And, and what I realized, um, in writing the devotional is that men need encouragement. I don't think they like to ask for it, but they don't get it very often and they're starving for it. Yes. Um, I heard somebody say recently that in the first two years of life, all you get in a, in a healthy situation, you get a ton of encouragement, you know, Hey, you know, you, you, you're crawling, you took your first steps, you know, I mean, the first couple of years, it's, it's all encouragement. Mm. And then after a couple of years, you start to hear more and more negative things. Mm. And by the time you reach adulthood and now, especially with social media, I mean, you're just bombarded with negative things all the time. Hmm. And so I think what I did and what I think a lot of men do is we, we knuckle down and, and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of barrel our way through the negativity and we're gonna prove to everybody that we can do things. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're starving for encouragement. Yeah. That that's that, that we're, we're trying to prove ourselves. So, so yeah. we're driven to succeed at work yep. or sports or hobbies. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you win a pickup game of basketball or, um, uh, a, a, a game, uh, with your friend, like yeah. an instant boost right. to your, to your ego. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but it can be empty, uh, after a while. Right. Especially if you lose, if you get sidelined, uh, um, several years ago, uh, I, I put so much of my identity and worth uh, into uh, c competing in, in martial arts. Uh -huh. and, and then w when I got injured, yeah, I, I f totally fell into a depression and funk uh, yep. because that, I was putting so much of my self-worth in that. Um, exactly. And, uh, and, and it, the same, same thing for uh, ma marriage or even with how yep. our kids are doing. Like if our, um, our marriage is struggling or the kids are struggling um uh th that can really shake us um yep uh to an unhealthy d d degree if we put all our eggs in in the that basket of, of right. our, our marriage looking good or, or our right. kids looking good um the i think i think that's why men men a lot of times will i'll, I'll speak for myself my marriage is, is a constant struggle, my first marriage. Um, so what I did, I mean, I, I worked on the marriage, we went to counseling, but relationships for me are just hard. Hmm. And it's much easier, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get that, um, that job done at work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get that project going and, and we're, we're gonna make this project successful or I, I play competitive tennis. So hmm. I'm gonna go out and, and have a good, good year this year in my league. Those are things that, you know, if you put in the effort, you can usually see progress and, um, martial arts, similar thing, right? I mean, you, you do, you do the work and you're going to get the results. Relationships aren't that way. Hmm. And, you know, and if your kids are struggling with something, you, you can't apply the same principles. You can't just, well, I'm going to get in there and work the problem, you know, mm -hmm. um, and make them work and just right, push them. Right. Yeah, yeah. Push them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is just the wrong thing to do. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I think that, um, 
men need to hear that. Um, first of all, you got to turn this stuff over to God. You, you've got to, you've got to get guidance from God. You, you've got to have trusted friends near you that can, that can help you with this stuff. But, but you need the encouragement that, you know, God still loves you. I still love you. Mm. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to be your friend no matter how many times you screw up. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you need, you need that. Mm. You desperately need that. Yeah. And I think because, because guys have so few close friends, especially in the church, they're not getting, a lot of them are not getting it. Mm. Their tanks are empty on the encouragement side. And so they're, their recourse is, well, let me just throw myself into work. Let me throw myself into sports. Let me throw myself into this. And it's the opposite of what they should be doing, but they're, they're, they're trying to fill their tank themselves versus getting it filled with encouragement and, and with time with God. Yeah. So you've, you've written a d- devotional to, to, to help men with that. And if, if I remember right, you, you were in the middle of that um writing that when when uh your your marriage was was uh struggling or or ending yeah um did so i'm guessing you're you're writing lots of encouragement to yourself to get through this really painful thing yeah a lot of your yeah i wrote this book for my i wrote this book for myself i mean first Mm -hmm. and foremost it it, the process of writing this if i had never sold a copy it it would have been great for me because it Mm -hmm. it you know Honestly, there were many days where I was typing the words into the computer, but, you know, God was helping me write this Mm -hmm. and I'd be crying at the end of crying at the end of writing a devotion to not, it, it, it got me so close to God. Um, and I, I, for whatever reason, um, well, I started off and I was going to do 365 devotions and I, I, I went through the Bible and I picked as many encouraging verses as I could find. So I went through and I had, um, but, and because the Bible is, you know, three fourths old Testament, I had a lot of verses from the old Testament and a couple of months into it. Um, I realized I was never going to get this done. I mean, I had written like 60 and I had 305 to go. And it was just, it was never going to happen. So I sat down with my daughter who is a prolific, a prolific author. She's had, I think by next year, she will have had 12 or 15 books published. Wow. And she is 25 right now. That's amazing. (laughs) Um, But I sat down with her and I said, okay, you know, what do you think I should do with this? And so she and I kind of jointly came up with, all right, rather than doing a verse for every day. Why don't you think about doing a verse for every two days? And that way, the first day can be your thoughts on the verse. The second day can be the passage that it came from, a related passage. And then um, you can have questions so that people can really try to reflect on and then apply the Bible passages to their lives. I said, that's a great idea because you just cut my work in half. (laughs) So I, I, I proceeded with that, but I was already 60, 60 devotions into the old Testament. So I said, okay, I'll just do old Testament. I don't think anybody's done this before. So I'm going to do a, a year long daily devotional and it's going to be all old Testament verses. Well, then it occurred to me that I had never really read the old Testament. <laughs> I mean, I had read Psalms and I had read the first five books of the Bible, except for Leviticus. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I hadn't read Hosea. I had, I hadn't even heard of Obadiah, you know, but now, now I had this project where I was going to do this. And, uh, my daughter bet me that I couldn't write. I couldn't include a verse from Obadiah. She said, it's, it's impossible. You can't do it, especially in a book about encouragement. So that, that's, then I had to do it. Uh, but it was great because, you know, so here I am and okay. I've got to do something from second Kings. So what am I doing? I'm reading second Kings. I'm reading Hosea. I'm reading Amos and, you know, scripture is scripture. There's so much good stuff in the old Testament that I had never, I had never read before. Mm -hmm. So some days I'd be, I'd be reading, trying to write a devotion and I just end up 
blow on the whole day because I'd get caught up in a story in second Kings or something and, and just read the Bible. Mm-hmm. But it was great, you know, and, and, um, you know, I found stories like, um, Jonathan's son, I can't remember his name, but the one that ends up, um, um, crippled or paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then David wants to honor Saul, even though Saul had tried to kill him numerous times. And so he finds Jonathan's son and ends up elevating him to being in his court. And, you know, he, he eats at his table and mm. there's just so many good, you know, there's so many good That's stories a story. and, and a yeah. devotional is a yeah, devotional is basically a bunch of stories. You know, you just, you say, here, here's a verse and, mm. and here's a, a story or two to kind of bring it to life. So at that point, it became, it was, it was a great experience for me, but it was just, you know, it opened up so much of God's word to me and just thinking about how, how to apply this, not just to my life, but how other men might apply this to their lives. It still took me almost a year to write the thing, but it was a year that I I wouldn't trade for anything. Mm -hmm. It was just a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the, the, that came out in, in uh 2018 2018 yeah 2018. november of 2018 yeah yeah and uh with with that you're 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 um you're speaking at men's conferences or or doing, i was just attend i was attending yeah oh. i i i really i mean i was a nobody i still kind of consider myself a nobody so um nobody's gonna have me speak at a conference um but I, i'll tell you so um so we're getting into late 2018 with my daughter's help. And by the grace of God, I found a Christian publisher, Broad Street Publishing, that agreed to publish the book, which I got to tell you, I, I, maybe you have some authors in your audience, but this doesn't happen very often. I mean, when you're, when you're a first time author, it's really hard to get a contract with, with anybody. Um, and worse i was writing for men and and there's this stigma in the publishing industry that men don't really read and and so the vast majority of devotionals are written for women couples devotionals are written for women even some men's devotionals are written for women because the theory is that well she's going to buy this for her husband or for her boyfriend or for her son so we'll make it attractive to her and she'll buy it as a gift. So when a first time author has a men's devotional, nobody expects it to do very well. They just, they, and my, my, my marketing team and my publisher, they asked me, well, what, what are your goals with the book? And basically I, I needed them to sell 10,000 copies because of the way the contract was structured. And so I said, well, I, I, I hope we sell 10,000 copies. And they said, you're a first time author. You, you, you know, basically you should be happy if we sell 5,000 copies of this. Hmm. Um, and I, I had to agree with them. You know, I, I, you know, I like the book, but you know, <laughs> I had never written anything before. So, um, so again, I mean, this is all a God thing, but the book has done extraordinarily well. Um, and I'll hold it up. I, I know we got video, but you know, it's got a really nice leather cover. Um, and they did a great job with it. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful book. Um, it, it looks great outside and in, but half of the sales of this book have come from the little inspirational reading racks that you see in your supermarket, um, you oh, know, yeah. gas stations, right. Hotels, mm-hmm. airports, uh, Choice Books is the company that markets through those, you know, CVS, you'll see it in, you know, drugstores. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just been, it's been, it's blown me away how this book is done. But more importantly than that, um, every now and then a guy will contact me and uh, tell me that he got the book and tell me a story. And it's like CLC all over again. I mean, you know, these guys are just opening up to me and telling me that, you know, they were struggling with this or they're having trouble in their marriage or, you know, out of work. Hmm. And my book encouraged them. 
you know? And so it's just, you know, that's, that's payment. That's payment enough. You know, I, if I never made a dime on this book, it, it, you know, what just having, feeling. having somebody, you know, take the time to write me and say, Hey, I was blessed by your book. is just, has just been wonderful. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's inspiring to me. Uh, because, uh, I, I wrote a first draft of a book, uh, f- five years ago, uh, a parenting, uh-huh. a parenting book. And as I was writing it, the, the kind of the, 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 the subtitle, uh, that I had in my mind as I was writing is that it's a parenting book for, for, for guys who don't read parenting books, you know, as the, you know <laughs> right, I was right. try, trying to make it fun, kind of tongue in cheek. Um, uh, but, but it's been dormant. Uh, so, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll see if I could take another, uh, yeah. a swing at it. Um, the, uh, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you'd be willing if, to, to, to kind of wrap up our time today, if you'd be willing to, to sure. share, share one of the devotionals, uh, oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. With, with listeners. All right. Well, let me, uh, let me find one that's, uh, Sorry, I should have had one ready. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do one. There are very few in here that, that talk about me. I basically hid behind other people in this devotional. Um, <laughs> because uh, first of all, I don't think I'm that interesting a person. Um, and when I can talk about, you know, C.S. Lewis or somebody else or Pistol Pete Maravich or uh, talk about a movie like uh, Field of Dreams or something. That's uh, mm. that's much better than. Uh, actually, uh, I'll tell you what. I'll, I won't read one about myself. I'll, I'll read the probably the easiest one to write, um, and it was um, a speech that was made at my son's commencement, mm. and I basically got the permission. It, it, it was a terrific teacher at a Christian school in Northeast Ohio. Um, and I'll try not, I'll try not to cry when I read this, but basically I, I just asked him to send me his, um, his notes from his presentation that he gave at the, uh, at the, at the commencement. So it's called an unspectacular life. Mm-hmm. And the verse is, if, um, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, which is now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the duty of man. Solomon lived a spectacular life highlighted by untold riches, 1,000 wives and concubines, and the construction of a majestic temple. But at the end of his life, he wrote that, quote, all is vanity and a striving after wind, Ecclesiastes 114. At a 2017 high school commencement ceremony, teacher Eric Ling told about someone who lived a far less spectacular life, his father, who had died 18 months earlier. As Lin grew up, his father spent a lot of time alone in his study. In the house for the first time after his dad's death, Ling went into his dad's study. And here's a quote from him. In his desk, in his desk drawer was a long prayer list of specific people and exactly what they were going through, said Ling, with a reminder to himself, pray daily. Next to this was a second list, a list of people my father knew who needed help and exactly what that help might be. Several of these he was crossing out one by one. What a testimony in his most private and alone times, my father was living out what he believed, not for personal recognition, but for the kingdom. At the funeral, person after person spoke to us of how my father just showed up. Whenever someone was in need, he was there. This was significant for many reasons, but mostly because my father was painfully quiet. He would blend into any room unnoticed, and he actively spurned recognition of any kind. He lived by earthly standards, an unspectacular life, and experienced little professional success, yet he had a high calling. His vocation was to show God's love to others by being faithful with his gifts. And everyone he encountered, including myself, saw glimpses of the kingdom through this simple man, humility, self-sacrifice, love of God, love of others, generosity. 
May each of us live such an unspectacular life of obedience and faithfulness. Yeah, I told you I'd cry. Amen. So, I mean, I was sitting at commencement and listening to the speech and (laughs) I was in the midst of writing a devotional and, uh, you know, sometimes God just hands you stuff and he just handed me this. And, And there were so many examples I could give you where God just handed me something to say. And I just kind of put a bow on it and included it in the devotional. Mm. So, yeah. The, uh, that, that author is a father. I, I like how he, he showed up, um, yeah. but, but he was quiet. Yep. Um, I, I, I think a lot of men are, are in, in church and they're sitting, uh, in, in the seats and in the pews and, there's this picture of the way we do church that um, leaders are, are loud, leaders are talented, leaders are up front, whether they're teaching right. and preaching or doing music. Um, but men, like we, we, we need men and women, but we, we need to some, something to do. Right. And, and we need uh, those friendships, those, those connections. And, when when you do that um e- even if it's unspectacular it it means a lot to a lot of people yep yep yeah and it, it's really neat to that would have that would have been a, that would have been a great funeral to go to i mean I, I i it sounds odd to say but i've i've been to memorial services that are just so wonderful because people stand up and say stuff like that like you know this person came to me when I had a need and, you know, didn't ask for anything and never got any recognition, but we're the hands and feet of Christ. You know, it's just, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the last, uh, uh, episode I I recorded is a a start of the year, uh, episode, Mm -hmm. uh, about, um, just asking people what, what difference do you want to make, uh, in this world? Um, and, and who are the people that you want to make a difference, whose lives that you want to make a difference in. Um, so it, it's really neat, uh, Chris, to, um, uh, one-on-one uh, over coffee and breakfast, you're doing that, but then also through your books, uh, yeah. through your devotional. Um, so a, a, as we uh, wind uh, down our time today, what's next for you? Well, um I have another devotional coming out this year and, uh, (laughs) given that it took me a year to write daily strength for men, I, I had an epiphany and I have a a weekly book coming out. So it's 52 weeks of strength for men. Hmm. Um, and the devotional, the devotions are a little longer. Um, I've got seven passages for you to read. So my goal as with the, the first book is to get men into the Bible every day. Um, and you know, when I was in CLC, I was in the Bible every day. And then when CLC ended, I, I kind of drifted. So I, I, again, I wrote this for myself, you know, get get into the discipline of getting into your Bible every day and God will show you amazing things. So, um, that's coming out in April. And then the, the first book daily strength for men actually is being translated into Spanish. Wow. Which is really exciting. I, I don't, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I can, I can read it well. And I, I, I helped with the translation a little bit, but, um, I'm, I'm super excited because I mean, in the Spanish speaking communities in, in the U S I mean, Christianity is, is vibrant. And, um, I'm just, I'm hoping that the book can have, um, an impact and, and be an encouragement and be a, a tool for, for men who speak English or Spanish. So that's a real blessing to me that that was able to be done. And that's coming out, I think a little bit later, probably May or June for that one. Okay. I'll, I'll watch for that. Um, where, where can uh, folks uh, order your first devotional and how can they uh, uh, connect, connect with you or follow uh, you? you? Um, like I said, the first one, I mean, go to your local supermarket and <laughs> you might find it there. Um, it's on, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, christianbook.com, um, you know, Walmart target. It's, it's, it's amazing how many places you can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But um, if you want to order it from me, I've got I've got a stock uh, in my closet right behind me, and um, uh, and you can you can get in touch with me. The easiest way is to go to my website, which is uh, my first name and last name. It's chrisbollinger.com. I, I used to joke that my my last name just do the Goldfinger theme song, Goldfinger, but say Bollinger. Um, <laughs> but it's B-O-L-I-N-G-E-R. So chrisbollinger.com, or you can find um, Daily Strength for Men wherever wherever books are sold. <laughs> great, great. All right. Th- thank you so much, uh, Chris, for, for, for coming on. I, I hope uh, the, um, the, the 52 weeks that uh, uh, the, the book launch goes well as you wrap that up. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, share the links uh, that, that you mentioned uh, in, in the show notes. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, great. Blessings to you. All right. Thanks, Yvonne.